Welcome to Deep Dive MH370, Episode 30, A Triple Seven Pilot Weighs In. Hello again, I'm Andy Tarnoff, the publisher and founder of OnMilwaukee.com, a daily magazine and city guide based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And again, I'm joined by my co-host Jeff Wise, the author of The Taking of MH370, an aviation journalist and a guy who knows a lot about this topic. This week, we're also joined by a 777 pilot. His name is Juan Brown. He goes by the name Blanca Lirio on YouTube. And he is going to help us explain why theories touted by viral MH370 videos like Green Dot Aviation and Mentor Pilot have a major flaw. Jeff, with all due respect, I am concerned that you look like someone who might have been punched in the face after our last episode about Vladimir Putin. Are you doing okay? Well, the Spetsnaz came for me, and uh, I fought them off. You should see them. You should see them. <laughs> you should uh, see the other guy. Uh, I fell off my bike, in honesty. Um, okay. There was, it was just, a, I was got a, a little exuberant trying to jump over a curb, and I lost. I lost the game. But we could also just blame Vladimir Putin, because we spent an entire episode talking about him last week. Earlier, we talked about how someone could have stolen the plane. Right. And last week, we talked about why someone might have chosen to steal the plane. But yeah. today we have a, a really different and much more in-depth and technical podcast. We're actually going to uh, go deeper down an aspect that we've touched on before, but we need to really grapple with it because it's essentially the core of this mystery. It is the the center from which everything emerges. And I'm and I'm speaking specifically of the the reboot of the of the satcom or the of the sdu the satellite data unit and it's and it's important to talk about this because without this reboot without this box being turned off and back on again none of the data would exist we wouldn't have any of the of the slender thread of data that led investigators to follow the plane's path during its final six hours and ultimately wind up at its at its end point there would be no seabed search. This is going to be another one where we refer to some previous episodes. Yeah. I would love to think that everybody who is watching and listening to this has followed every single episode, but that's probably unrealistic. So we, we will, we're going to yeah. rehash some stuff, but we're going, to, we're going to add to it. And then we're also going to tell you where you can find more information. The satellite reboot is clearly the thing that has puzzled people the most, or at least I think it is, because just obvious solutions don't make sense. And yet there are some very popular videos circulating around YouTube right now with millions and millions of views yeah. that if you are an average non-pilot, non-investigative reporter, you know, like myself, and probably a lot of our audience, it yeah. seems very probable, or at least it seems explainable. So the reason that we have to refocus on, on the reboot of the SDU is because there are a number of really, really super popular, I would even say viral YouTube yeah. videos that have been circulating. One's by a YouTuber named Green Dot, mm -hmm. and another is by Mentor Pilot. We talked about Mentor Pilot a little bit in a previous episode um, where we talked about Whisper. And <laughs> These are have been extremely influential. And so that if you go to any kind of online discussion, sort of comment section about MH370, including ours, you will see people writing in and saying, oh, I know what happened. I watched the green dot. And to their credit, I mean, they're very, very well done. And I've watched them and I know a fair amount about this mystery at this point. And even yeah. I was like, oh, well, this... these guys are very smart. They yeah. know a lot. They're very effective communicators, and they've done a lot of research. Um, and I want to, I want to, you know, give them credit for all that. Um, but I think what happens is they both of them arrive at a conclusion that is like, here is a scenario we think it's right. And as I think we've said from episode one, um, is that the way to approach this case isn't to aim for certainty or to try to achieve a sense of like confidence. It's actually the reverse. It's to recognize what the weaknesses are in different arguments, to understand what all the different possibilities, to sort of, to try to cultivate a sense of not being sure. So yeah. that, because 
because it was a sense of certainty that led the authorities to be 100% confident that the plane was in the Southern Sea uh, on the seabed, and it wasn't. And so, the, so what we're the, the whole state of the mystery now is to try to understand why that might be. And so we want to cultivate a sense of uncertainty. And so in this case, I want to take a look at these videos and say, okay, how come I don't think they should be as confident as they are? Good, good. And there's, there's really two major components, and I want to focus on one today, which is okay. how they deal with the reboot of the SDU. And to be clear, we're not, we're not poo-pooing these guys. In fact, we love the fact that they're doing very thoughtful, well-done videos that bring some clarity to people. Even if you disagree with them, they do continue to move the conversation forward. So I don't think anyone should think that we're looking at these antagonistically. We're we're just breaking it down. So this isn't like this isn't episode 30 like rebuke. It's it's more yeah. like let's let's really dig into this and, and see what's possible, what's probable and what isn't. Well I have my own questions. Scientific inquiry is about disagreement. Actually, it's about different people bringing different perspectives, focusing on different parts of the data, trying to form a synthesis communally by arguing. Yeah. In, 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 but, but importantly, arguing in a collegial way, arguing in a so, way that, yeah. that, that respects the good intentions of the other party, right? And I say, and so I think it's really important to say, we believe that these guys are working in good faith. We think that these guys have a lot of talent and we want to try to, we're going to suggest to them, uh, you know, another way, uh, another way uh, to, to look at the situation. Yeah, I don't and know about I want, you, but I definitely don't think these guys are like nefarious and trying to advance some evil theory. This is just no. their best, their best guess on what happened. And I think they no. did a good job. And one thing I want to point out is that um, both Green Dot and Mentor Pilot um, rely heavily on the work of two French pilots right. um, named Patrick Blelly and Jean-Luc Marchand. And these are guys who made a presentation at the Royal Aeronautical Society. They, their, their work has gotten a lot of attention. They have a very detailed um, report that, that, that we'll link to in, in the show description and the show notes. Um, but so... When we when we disagree with these guys, what we're really disagreeing is with the scenario that was laid out by Blelly and Marshawn. Okay. We also have a very special guest today who is Juan Brown, and he's not just an experienced aviation pilot. He's a 777 pilot, mm -hmm. and he is the host of a very popular aviation channel on YouTube called Blanca Lirio. Yeah. Um, Juan is a super knowledgeable guy. He's been flying forever. Um, and that really comes through in his videos. He loves aviation. He loves flying. He's a keen recreational pilot himself. And I think as part of his love of aviation, he started making these videos and it's really cut on and he has a lot of admirers and he's kind of a role model, I think for us, Andy, in that he, he, he's a good communicator. Yeah. He's an effective communicator. But he also really, really knows his stuff. And I think that really comes through, you know, in this case, we're talking about the idea that we know that somebody on board this plane after the turn back, we're talking about MH370's disappearance on, on March 7th, March 8th, 2014. Um, we know that they turned off the satellite communication system. We know that because of the records that Inmarsat stored, there was no like, we're lo there was no log off. It just was a cold cutoff. And so that means that the electrical power had to be cut. And there's only three ways that this can be done. And we've talked about this in earlier episodes. People can go back if they want to. That's episode four and that's episode six. So right. those would be two that you'd want to check out yeah. for sure. That's a central crux of this mystery. It's hard to right. explain. Uh, if you, if that be a, if, if that SDU didn't get turned off and turned back on, there would not be these seven ping arcs. We wouldn't get the BFO analysis, right. which is what, ostensibly told us which of the two directions the plane went in north or south right and without that they would have had no reason to do their search in the southern indian ocean exactly so all of that that's why this is so important so you can either go into the electronics bay and pull some circuit breakers which would be hard to do because remember zahari said goodnight malaysia um, mh370 and then a minute later everything got turned off so it's not a lot of time to run down into electronics bay and then come back. 
what a lot of people think, the sort of the default view is that he must have done it from the cockpit. And there is a way you can do it from the cockpit, but it's pretty radical. You reach up to the overhead panel on the left-hand side. You can, you can switch off the generators and you can disconnect the backup, AP, the uh, alternative power unit, auxiliary power unit, and, and totally isolate all of the electrical systems. And this is a very radical thing to do. You can also do a smaller version of that, which is just to isolate the left-hand side of it. Mm -hmm. But this is what we wanted to ask Juan about, which is as you, as a pilot, of people, someone who flies triple sevens. I think this would be a great time to, to jump in and ask him these questions. Juan, it is a real honor to have you uh, here with me today. Um, you are an extremely experienced pilot as well as an extremely experienced podcaster. Um, so that's really a magic combination. Um, and you've been very generous to agree to talk to me today. Um, wanted to ask you very specifically, mm -hmm. um, you, you have a lot of, you, you've flown many types of aircraft. Um, one of them is a triple seven, mm -hmm. um, and you have been flying as a, a first officer with, Amer um, we don't need to say the airline, but I know you're not too shy about it, but you fly triple sevens to London. Yep. And Sydney. And Sydney as well. Okay. So long haul flights mm -hmm. and you've flown, um, a whole bunch of other sort of other kinds of aircraft, including earlier generations. And I was wondering if you kind of characterize from the flight crew perspective what the triple seven is like as a in terms of its electrical system because this was a boeing's first fly-by-wire yeah correct it does have fly-by-wire controls it is electric and hydraulic and it's to me it's kind of represents the epitome of the best of boeing's engineering and development between the boeing 757 and then the triple seven that was just the apogee of of boeing development and it just makes a Real easy to fly, honest flying, easy flying, large aircraft. Right. And so obviously the electrical system is very important for the 777. Mm -hmm. um, you, there are some, as I understand it, there are some flight control surfaces that are directly, um, there's, a, there's a mechanical linkage, I think, to some spoilers. But for the most part, the ailerons, the rudder, and so, and so forth, these are um, moved, the, there's electrical actuators which move hydraulically powered surfaces right correct and it's all goes through the flight computer system it is fly by wire uh so it goes through the the flight computer system and that gets the input to the hydraulics which in turn move the controls okay so i think it was sort of top of mind for boeing engineers that if if there's a flaw that's going to cause uh, an interruption in electrical power we're going to have a backup we're going to have redundancy mm -hmm. And so you're, you, the, the, the system is designed so that you don't find yourself without electrical power. So you, you've got two generators in the, connected to the cool. engines. You've got loads of generators, loads of backup. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Now, as we, we, I was talking with you a little bit before um, we got on uh, the call. Uh, on the overhead panel, there is a section mm -hmm. to the left. This is your electrical power systems. And you can do things such as shut down a generator. You can you can um, isolate a, a tie bus that that lets uh, one bus share power with the other. Um, under what circumstances would you normally uh, be involved with something like that? It's flipping switches on that panel. The whole idea with a Boeing aircraft is you want a dark cockpit. You mm -hmm. know everything is going smoothly when the cockpit is basically dark. Each of those switches um, have associated lights and warnings, and and then you've got ICAST messages on the instrument panel. But if everything's operating normally, there's no lights. So okay. you do not, under any circumstances, go messing about with these switches mm. until you are directed to by an emergency procedure. And okay. the checklist will pop up on the ICAST um, screen, and it will tell you exactly what to do and in what order to do them. And that's the only time you would ever mess with any of those switches. Okay. And are there any uh, emergency procedures that come to mind that would direct you to uh, flip some of those switches? Sure. Any kind of electrical uh, situation, loss of generator power, um, uh, there, any, uh, any of the electrically associated emergencies will get you involved with potentially uh, dealing with that panel. Okay. 
Um, and this is something that you study. I'm sure you probably uh, carry out this kind of procedure in the simulator. In your years of actually flying on the 777, have you had to do anything like no, that? No, never. Not, no. <laughs> never yeah. had to mess with the uh, electrical system at all in all the years of uh, flying the 777. These things are so reliable. In all my years of flying uh, for the airlines, that'd be 25 years now, I've only had one engine failure in 25 years, uh, one engine shutdown. And so they're just extremely reliable machines. And that was a remarkable enough circumstance that you got interviewed uh, <laughs> by a newspaper for it, as I saw. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Our local paper. But it was kind of a non-event as it made the, made, yeah. you, you sounded rather cheerful in describing it. You didn't seem too <laughs> distraught. Yeah, it worked out perfect. Uh, we just did what we were trained to do and uh, we were coming back from Hawaii and, and we went through our procedures and uh, went on ahead on into Los Angeles uneventfully for the ILS down to minimums uh, on one engine. And most of the passengers just slept right through the event and didn't even know uh, what happened. <laughs> well, that's comforting to know. Um, that was in the Boeing 757, not the 777. Oh. So, so far, no problems on the 777. Okay. Yeah, it's a very safe aircraft. Um, but it's also a complicated aircraft. Um, you know, it has a lot of redundancy. It's very robust. But robust systems often require a lot of, um, you know, foresight on the part of the engineers, which can involve complexity. When you, if you were to do something like, say, isolate the entire left AC bus, that would cause, I mean, I don't know if it's even, if you even know what it would do. Right. You don't even know what it causes. And somebody, <laughs> uh, let's see, what was the old saying? Somebody knows where all the wires are, but nobody knows where all the wires go to. In other right. words, when you start messing with these systems, you're going to cause downstream effects that you have no idea uh, what those outcomes are going to be. The road of unintended consequences are huge when you start messing with these different electrical systems. So by, again, by no means do you ever mess with these electrical systems unless you are directly told to by a checklist procedure. Right. I think something that a lot of people who aren't familiar with air accident investigation or, or flying aircraft might know is that really safety is about establishing procedures and following those procedures. You don't just go winging it, right? You can't. You absolutely can't in these uh, complicated aircraft. It's taken years of of development in standard operating procedures and crew resource management, and mostly all learned through accident, prior accident investigations to develop such an incredibly safe system. Okay, Jeff, I think there are a couple takeaways from that very good interview. Uh, nice job on that. Thank what, you. What, yeah. What, you know, what did you, what did you get from Juan? Um, I mean, first of all, and this is something I've heard from a lot of 777 pilots, but, but it's great to hear it from Juan. I mean, he, he, made, he made the point very clearly himself, but the idea is that you just don't mess with the electrical system. He talks about you want a dark panel. What he means is that you don't want warning lights. Like the job of a 777 pilot, people think of pilots as like, um, you know, Snoopy, you know, with his stick and rudder and like, yeah. you know, flying around in the sky with his, with, by, by moving his ailerons. A, a modern airline pilot is like a systems manager. They've got this really complicated system. They don't really know how it works because almost no human being does, but they Why know yeah. how to follow the procedure. Yeah. Right. And so his goal is to reduce the errors. And if you and if lights are going off, you want to if, meaning illuminating, you want to turn them off. Right. You want to solve problems. And so isolating just the, even the left AC bus, let alone the entire electrical system, is just causing an almost infinity of problems. Right. And so the idea that um, a triple seven pilot would have some plan in mind and a core part of this plan is I'm going to turn off all the electrical power in my plane. Like that is a really crazy plan, and, and and it's not impossible. I mean, this is the this is this is why we wanted to bring Juan in because I think there's a distinction between impossible and really really nuts. Because technically, yes, they're abs they're absolutely correct. You can get the SATCOM to depower by shutting off the entire electrical system. But you know, it's I I think that most of us don't really have an intuitive sense of like how a triple seven pilot regards making problems for himself. But like, imagine I said to you, 
Um, I think you should go visit your grandmother. And I think that you should get there by taking, you know, Main Street to Oak Street and then go backwards up the off ramp, you know, to I-80 and drive backwards down the highway until you get to the next exit and then get off and like turn on to your mother's, your grandmother's street. You'd be like, excuse me, I'm not driving backwards on the highway. It's just like you're, you're if you, you know, when you train as a student driver, they, you know, it, it's like <laughs> rule number one, don't drive backwards on a highway, right? I think that turning off the electrical system on it in the triple seven is like driving backwards on a highway. It's like just putting yourself in so much danger. What to say five minutes on your drive to your grandmother's house, you know? Okay. Well, my job here right now is to play devil's advocate. So okay. I'm just going to go do it. So you said, and Juan said, yeah. it's not impossible, but it's right. extraordinary. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about how extraordinary that would be. First of okay. all, you said you, accurately said that a triple seven pilot isn't snoopy flying his world war one plane with the stick right but pilots do know how to do that if they need to it's not preferred they, but they, they know how to fly a plane by by stick well i think another point that one made is that you don't just go freelancing you don't just go experimenting with like what if i pull circuit breakers what you do do is follow an emergency checklist and there have been people over the years who have speculated on, well, maybe there was some kind of electrical fire and you had to, and this thing had to happen. I think that that has not really, that doesn't really hold water. And that isn't what they're suggesting here. Um, and so the idea that this guy did it um, in order to achieve something um, is a, a, a super, super, super huge stretch, like an implausible stretch. Um, yeah, but on the other hand, yeah, yeah. if Sahari did this, he did it with the purpose of committing suicide. So what's really the risk in him doing something that would set off all these warning lights that would be impossible or improbable or unlikely or might cause terrible things to happen to the plane? He was, If he was committing suicide, he was planning to die anyway. Okay, so let's talk about what he gets in return for this crazy maneuver. Yeah. Um, what does he get? Well, in um, Green Dot's video, um, he the, the idea is that he gets instead, it, it, because when he logs, the idea is that if you log off ACARS by just deselecting it from the instrument panel, it will send a log off signal. Right. And that that would be a clue he didn't want to send because he wants this to be the perfect crime. So he's yes. willing to incur this incredible inconvenience and danger for the sake of committing the perfect crime. And there's a couple of problems with that. One is that there's nobody on the ground monitoring these um, transmissions who's going to notice any this kind of arcane level of detail. Like with Air France 447, actually, we saw this where the plane was sending these signals these ACARS messages that they're going to a, an Air France operations center and they were getting logged, but nobody was reading them. It wasn't until after the plane disappeared that people go back and look at the logs and, and try to determine what's happening. So in real time, this wouldn't do you any good because nobody is monitoring these transmissions with that kind of level of, of, of care, right? But the second thing is that they're flying over, he was flying over a Malaysian Air Force base with radar. So it's like his attempt to, if his attempt was to commit the perfect crime, he would have, as we've proposed before, just kept going past Bitod, you know, out into the open ocean and just put it in the Marianas Trench. Turning, right. He's turned back and flown over an Air Force base. That is not the perfect crime. In fact, he's, it's almost like, hey, look at me, I'm doing this crime. And so this idea that you're going to go through all these lengths to eradicate a totally arcane, subtle thing that nobody would be looking at anyway, I think doesn't make sense. And I think yeah, I mean, I think that's legit. There, there were easier ways for him to avoid being seen than exactly what he would have done. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 so I think that, I think it's important to say, so, so a lot of people are watching Green Dot, they're watching a mentor and they're saying, oh, okay, I understand what happened. Because when you tell a narrative, um, you can choose, you can kind of tell any narrative if you pick the data that you want to explain 
and you ignore the other stuff and you don't kind of interrogate. I guess that's what we're doing. We're interrogating a hypothesis. And I, I encourage people to interrogate the hypothesis that we present here. It has been interrogated. I think some of them, you know, with, you know, sometimes some of them are harder to explain than others. Um, but I think I think the essence of trying to solve a mystery is interrogating a hypothesis uh, weak points. Um, and and so that's that's just what we're trying to do here. When you start pulling circuit breakers or even isolating whole buses, you don't really know what's going to happen. Um, you can do a lot of research. I mean, in, 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 if we're even going to contemplate that somebody did this, they would have had to do a ton of research that because they must have known things that a, an ordinary 777 pilot um, wouldn't know. I mean, I remember right when all of this was happening back in you know early 2014, I asked 777 pilots, I said, how do you, how would you um, depower the SDU? And they're like, what? <laughs> what they, is an they, SDU? They didn't even like, know what it was. That's something they even right? normally know. Right. So, so Zahari would have had to be a mind reader. He would have had to have been, I mean, his home flight simulator probably wouldn't have been sophisticated enough to anticipate what would have actually happened had he done this sort of stuff. I mean, keep in mind, it's... This was a while ago. Even probably today's consumer grade flight simulators probably couldn't do that. It's, that's, this is this is indeed some very questionable, sophisticated stuff. It involves yeah. the, the 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 rat. I mean, like you know, uh, <laughs> it involves real risk. It involves an incredible level of knowledge and understanding, all in the service of no apparent benefit. And you said, "Well, he's going to go kill himself anyway. What does it matter?" And I would say it 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 sure if you're gonna posit a pilot who is crazy and ha and doesn't need motives because his brain is like full of worms um but I think that's really kind of letting yourself off the hook i mean e even if you if you're it, e even killing yourself is a goal that if you know if you're rat i mean even there there is a certain rationality in like if your goal is to jump off a bridge, then driving to the bridge is rational because that's what you have to do to get to the bridge. And mm -hmm. so if his, if his goal is to fly into the Southern Indian ocean, then it's rational to, you know, have enough fuel to get there, to go in the correct direction towards the Southern Indian ocean and to, you know, um, and so all of this actually makes achieving that goal harder. So even within the context of his own insanity, it's not rational. It's yeah, it's impossible to get inside his head, but I, we just are having a hard time understanding how he would have been able to anticipate every future investigation, how he would have been able to do something that had never been tried before in real life, how he could have practiced for it, how he could have pulled it off perfectly. And I guess that's the thing with these two videos that we're about to show these clips of. I mean, it makes it seem like it's you know, like a fairly straightforward thing to do. And it, it just yeah. isn't. I will say that like, in a way it's progress because when the, in, when the mystery of MA370 was initially un, unfolding, some of the early documentaries that were made about it talked about the SATCOM data, the Inmarsat data as, um, as if this, the SATCOM had stayed on the entire time. Which right. was a very reasonable assumption to make. Of course. And, but again, demonstrates once again that you can't really assume anything about MH370 because a lot of your assumptions are going to be wrong. Yeah. Um, so the fact that we're even, you know, just debating how the SDU got rebooted is in a way progress, even if the explanations are much more problematic than people seem to realize. Um, so, so in a way that is progress. But I think we really, uh, the point of this whole episode is to say people are buying onto these very convincing, um, scenarios these documentaries that lay out a scenario and they and they're coming away convinced that this is right and there's actually major major problems now we're not saying it's 100 percent impossible but it's very very problematic this would be a great time for us to cut away to these little clips and then we will respond to them let's start with the mentor pilot the most likely reason for this satcom loss was a power failure to the system itself now this system can be powered from several different electrical buses and from most of the aircraft's redundant power sources. So this fact has led some incredibly experienced Boeing 777 pilots, whose excellent work I will be linking to in the description, by the way, 
to believe that whoever was in charge of the aircraft after that initial turn must have manually turned off all of those sources. This can be done by deselecting both the primary and backup generators from their buses using the buttons on the overhead panel. After that, the aircraft would react by trying to auto-start the APU in order to replace those systems, so the person in charge would then have to put the APU switch to on and then back off again to stop that auto-start from happening. If that would happen, that would then trigger the Ram Air Turbine, the RAT, to be activated either manually or automatically, and it would start to provide electrical power for the most critical systems, like primary flight displays, navigation displays, and navigation equipment, but not the autopilot. Hydraulic movement of the flight controls would not be a problem since both engines were still working and providing hydraulics, so maneuvering the aircraft manually would still work perfectly fine. Now, of course, removing the primary power sources in this way would cause everything else except emergency lighting to go black in the aircraft, and it's likely that this would make things very difficult for both the crew and the passengers in the back. A couple of things. He starts off by saying that the, these this knowledgeable people, and he's talking about Bolli and Marchand here, um, they say that all of these systems had to be turned off. That is not actually true. You could just isolate the left AC bus, which is so the the, the alternating current um, power grid of this airplane is divided into parts so that in the event of an emergency, the flight crew can, you know, shut down part of it without shutting down the whole thing. Um, and the, the satellite data unit is on the left AC mm -hmm. bus. So you don't need to turn off everything. So doing this kind of extreme level of shutting everything down isn't really even necessary. So if we're positing that, that Zahari had this, you know, God level knowledge of the electrical system, he probably wouldn't do this. And I think that, which re leads me to number, point number two I want to make about this clip is that as he says it, oh, first of all, what he's saying is correct. Like you would, you, you, the things that the exact steps that he's talking about, yes, those will have the effect he describes. But then at the end, he points out that, yeah, practically nothing will have electrical power anymore. Mm -hmm. And the plane will be basically like, imagine a city during a blackout. Like that's what's happening. You'd have a couple of really critical things that are running off of generators. Um, in, in this case, running off the rat, um, and everything else is dead. And so, and so in this video, mm -hmm. in what follows, um, he, he, and all, the same thing is true in Green Dot, is that they imagine the entire plane has been depowered, but then what you see is a plane that has all of its things working normally. You know, and so none of these effects are actually um, taking place. And this is another reason why this idea is so problematic. Remind me how long the SDU was off? Um, we don't know exactly when it was turned off, but presuming it was turned off at the same time as everything else, it, it would be pretty much an hour. That's a long time to fly a plane by stick doing these complex maneuvers. It's flying from waypoint to waypoint in a way that's very consistent with autopilot. As yeah. he's just said, there is no autopilot if you do what he's proposed. Um, and you're making your life really, really, really difficult at a time when you're presumably, um, you know, venturing into well, the unknown and probably want your life to be as easy. You want to have as few problems as possible at this point. And you also just made you're a lot in the of process problems. of, yeah, you're, I mean, according, well, as we'll watch at the Green Dot video, you're also in the process of murdering your co-pilot and your every passenger on board and you're flying the plane perfectly straight and level without autopilot over a Malaysian military base. Uh, Green Dot guy talks about that a little bit. I think this would be a good time to switch over and watch a little bit of that. Back at Agari, when the captain had cut power to the plane's two main electrical generators, the aircraft's computers had diverted the limited remaining electrical power to only the plane's most essential systems. But now, almost an hour after this had happened, the plane had begun throwing up warnings, saying that the computer room underneath the cockpit, known as the E&E bay, was getting too hot. Its cooling fans were one of the things which had lost power when the main electrical generators were depowered. So Harry didn't fancy finding out what would happen if the computers which powered his cockpit screens and the aircraft's massively complicated systems overheated. According to his checklists, 
the very least that would happen was that his screens would start going blank. Without them, he would not be able to complete his mission. He had to restore power to the cooling fans. Flight 370 was nearing the edge of Lankawi's primary radar. After this, Zahari would be free, totally unseen by the outside world. He decided that once he was outside of radar range, he would be safe. So what we have here is another problem with the total depowering scenario, which is it, 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 you don't really have a good reason for turning it off, and you don't really have a good reason for turning it back on. Um, because I think the explanation here is problematic. You basically got this whole elaborate plan and then, oh boy, the, the electronic bay is overheating. And I guess my first reaction is, okay, it's overheating because things are running, but you've had everything depowered. Yeah, so so they're not how, where's, the, where's the electricity coming from that you're running all this equipment, but you're not running the fan? And I don't know... I haven't, again, I haven't delved into it deeply enough to be able to cha cite chapter and verse because I don't, I don't think it really merits the effort, frankly. But it's like, I don't know what the source is that will say that, like, if you depower the entire plane, you'll have enough equipment running in the electronics bay that it's going to get really hot. But they they haven't made the provision that the, the cooling fan would run. Well, I think, I, mean, I think the thing here is that in a video like this, which again is super well done, it's presented like yeah. fact. It's not presented right. in like a maybe this may have happened sort of way. Right. And right. thus, you know, I, I mean, I saw this on, on Milwaukee.com. We did our annual April Fools edition on April 1st. And, you know, the most insane fake stories we could come up with with the worst Photoshopping, like, Tens of thousands of people believe this, and it's, it's just okay. you know, I, and unfortunately, people just believe everything they see and everything they read. And when you present something as authoritatively as this, right, and it seems compelling and it's well done, I mean, even I was like, oh yeah, yeah that, that makes sense, and it just it just bears yeah, some more I mean, analysis, I think. I think that after this ran, um, I think uh, Green Dot made an effort to say, look, this is actually just a speculation. We don't know that this happened. This is just one explanation of, of what we of what we have evidence on. But I think it is an important point to make. And I guess that's sort of what I'm trying to drive here is that. When you present a, a theory to people and they and they are receptive to it, they think, oh, yeah, that's actually that was a compellingly made argument. I think that's true. I'm actually I'm going to believe that I'm going to think that that, that the mystery is essentially solved. And then I'm going to go on to comment sections <laughs> on other people's blogs and write, I know what happened. I saw this video. Um, and I, I get this a lot and I see it elsewhere too, where people feel like I saw the green dot video. I now know what happened. Yeah. And so what we're trying to do in this video is to say, look, don't be so certain. This is an explanation, but it is an explanation that has its flaws. Um, and you know, I, I reached out to the guy that makes uh, green dot. Uh, his name is Emmett. He's a very nice guy. And I, I, I said to him like, what? So his, the video is called what Emmett, what Netflix got wrong. And I said, well, what did we get wrong? Because this, this scenario, by the way, is very similar to the scenario that I kind of lay out in episode one of the Netflix documentary. Mm -hmm. And actually in this um, hour long video that we've just watched an excerpt from, he never actually says that Netflix is wrong about this. But so I asked him, I said, what, what did we get wrong in your estimation? And he said that um, it didn't pay enough attention to the theory that most people think is right. And you know what? I mean, how much is them is enough is, I guess, a question. But he's right that this is the default scenario. What he's laying out here, I think that probably if you if you talk to the independent group, they will say, well, turning off the entire electrical system is too much. But isolating the left AC bus. Yeah, that is the default scenario. I think it's still problematic um, for many of the same reasons that we've talked about today. But this is for all the complaints uh, I'm making about it today. I will acknowledge this is what the the right thinking conventional wisdom is about MA370. Um, I'm still pushing back against it, yeah. but this is I'm trying to basically pry people's fingers off a sense of certainty around this around this scenario. You know, Jeff, the this pilot suicide theory 
is, I mean, it's fine, but in order to do it, everything else becomes incredibly complicated and arcane. It's only a, it's, it's only a simple theory. If you overlook some of the glaring holes that, that we just looked at. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the criticisms I get again and again is people who, who think that the pilot suicide theory is simple um, and a very efficient way of explaining the evidence in hand and think that a spoof scenario was like super complicated and complex and arcane. And my answer to that is this theory is not as simple and powerful as you think. It only appears that way if you paper over some really glaring difficulties. I think that's this, the issue here. Yeah. So they're both really complicated and they're both really bizarre. Yeah, they're bizarre in different ways, which I think is important. One implies a almost superhuman level of sophistication on the part of the attacker. And the other requires just a string of incredible coincidences. Um, and, and, and coincidences coupled with someone doing a bunch of really extreme actions for no apparent reason, which is what we've been talking about today. I want to propose to you, Andy, that next yeah. week we, we look at another probably the other major problem with these popular theories. And that has to do with the, the absence of the wreckage from the seabed. And again, this relates to some other like seemingly incomprehensible, complicated actions that someone would take for no reason. And um, that way we will kind of wrap up a kind of comprehensive review of the major problems with these very popular scenarios. Okay. I like it. Let's do it. Okay. So we are wrapping up episode 30. Did you think we'd make it to episode 30, Jeff? <laughs> when we started talking like a year ago? I mean, I, 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 I didn't know if we'd get the first one, you know, out the door. First one took like, a really long time. Done it, you know? Yeah. But they got, they've become more efficient as we go on. So yeah. we have plenty, plenty more to, to do. This is the point where I mentioned that you should be liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel. And in fact, you can actually do more than that because that is super helpful and we do appreciate it. But if you become a member either through our YouTube channel, we'll put up a link for that or through our Substack channel, that is a way for us to put the revenue that we make right back into promoting this podcast and helping it grow. Uh, you could also be a sponsor of the episode and there's information on our show page at deepdivemh370.com. You can also email me at andy at on milwaukee.com and we will talk about a customized solution. I'd like to thank Jacob John, our Seattle Tacoma based singer songwriter for our amazing bumper music Sets yeah and let's me up every single time i hear it jeff i love it i love it i also want to give a shout out to emily margo phoenix who reached out to us yeah. she was enjoying the podcast and she was like i want to help these guys out what can i do and she just has a lot of social media chops so she's been helping us figure out things like tiktok Emily, thank you for, for helping us out. Really appreciate it. There are it. a lot of parts to making this successful, and it's more than us just shooting, talking, and editing, and posting. So thanks to everybody who is helping make this a success, sharing it with their friends, telling our story. Like, we're telling our story as we seek answers, and we seek... I mean, this one advanced the story because we we took a very two very popular theories, and we talked about them. And right. we again, we didn't poo-poo them. We just said, this is what we think is possible, not possible, what's likely and what's not likely. So I love that. I've been seeing some great comments on our YouTube channel with people making suggestions about very specific things. And we're reading yeah. them. We're replying. So keep them It's coming. a community, yes. Andy. I think that's really a, the, one of the major points of today's episode. It's a community. It's about conversation. It's about, uh, it's about working together, not attacking each other or undermining each other, assuming good faith on one another's part and trying to achieve understanding, um, which, which uh, you know, sometimes comes through trying to probe and, you know, stress test ideas. So, so, and we welcome stress tests of people write in and say, hey, you didn't, got, you, you didn't pronounce this thing right. You got this fact wrong. Um, what I about definitely didn't pronounce things right. That, that, that part's for sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. When it comes to my uh, Russian and sometimes my French, it's a lot yeah. of mispronunciation. But we'll, we'll keep We're trying. We're not perfect. We'll keep going. We are not perfect. But thank we want to work with you and want to hear your questions, want to hear your suggestions. And thank you for everything you, you guys do. Thank you, guys. And see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.